everyone. My name is Josh. And the role that I played was Ernest. And this is all very new for me. I'm very excited. All right, Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel Durant. And the character that I played was Mortz. Okay, Trishella. Hi, my name is Trishelle Edmond. This is my name sign, just like Texas. And I played the role of Martha. Sandra. I'm Sandra May Frank. And I, this is my name in sign language. And I played it the role of Vendela. Thank you, Amelia. Hi, my name is Amelia Hensley. This is my name in sign language, and I played the role of Tia. And Alexandria. Hi, everybody. My name is Alexandria Wiles. And I had the very distinct honor in this production of working on the creative team, as well as being a member of the ensemble in the show. I was the associate choreographer. And my role in the show was to cover for uh, any of the deaf adult women, specifically Marley Matlin. I was her coverage when she was unable to be in the show. These are not the only deaf members of our cast here with us today, both from Deaf West and on Broadway. We also want to recognize Russell, Marley Matlin, Anthony Natale, Wren, Joey Antonio, Kara Gutierrez, Howie Sego, and Hillary Beck. We also have the creative team and our ASL consultants as well. One of our ASL consultants was Anthony Natale. Another was Howard Stern, Linda Bove, and Amanda Green. The director was deaf as well, was Michael. Again, this show came together in 2014. And I want to start by asking what the audition process looked like. This is Daniel. I'm happy to start. Uh, before opening Spring Awakening, we actually started with a workshop of Spring Awakening before we decided to move forward with the show, just to see if it was workable. So we workshopped it for about two weeks, working on choreography, interpreting the music, and then we all came together to rehearse. And once we felt like we were ready to go ahead and move forward with the production, I was cast as Mortz. So that's how I came to be with Deaf West and Spring Awakening. So I actually was in DC at the time and had to video myself for the audition and send it. I really didn't know what it was going to look like. It was actually sort of a terrifying experience for me. And I sent it to them and didn't hear anything for about a month. I was working at MSSD, which is the school for the deaf in DC. And one morning I got an email. And it was actually Amelia, we were roommates at the time, texted me and asked if I had gotten an email. I hadn't seen it yet because it had been over a month since I had seen it. I'm living in DC. I sent it out to LA. I wasn't really expecting to hear back and especially not to have the role of Wendela. So that's how I got here. Okay, next, anyone else? Yes, I, very, I had a very similar experience. Uh, I have worked with some Broadway events before, working on storylines. And so my journey actually started from there. Okay, Miles. Well, I hadn't had experience videoing myself doing ASL before I got into this.
I had been involved locally with several roles in Deaf West Theater before. And several people reached out to me to be involved with this. So I worked with a friend of mine to video myself for the audition. And we had to do music. I also did a poem. And I also sent it in and didn't hear anything for quite some time. It was an interesting experience. But I was very blessed to be brought on board for this wonderful cast. So for those of you joining, Josh is having some technical difficulties, so he may be on and off. Hopefully he will be back with us shortly. Amelia, how did you audition for this? Look, you were required to interpret a song as well as have a passage uh, that you audition, audition with. And uh, I was not great at the music component of it. Um, I had been in a production at Gallaudet and it was one of my first musical experiences being in that show at Gallaudet. And I wasn't sure how to follow the beat. I really had to work hard on practicing what it was I wanted to interpret the music into. And I was able to get it videoed and sent off. And I knew that I wanted to be a part of this, but I didn't necessarily want to move to LA. And so it all ended up working out really perfectly. So when you got the role, were you thrilled? What were your feelings? What was your first reaction when you came into the room with this cast of deaf and hearing artists? What were your emotions in the creation of this show, Spring Awakening? Well, this is my third time working with Deaf West. And so I already had a little bit of the lay of the land. I was still really nervous when it came to Spring Awakening just because it's a musical production and I am profoundly deaf. I can't hear a thing. And so I was going to have to rely on visual cues and vibrations. And at that point, I didn't really have any idea what it meant to be a part of a musical. And so they sent me the script and I read over it and I realized that there were even more passages that were music and songs, which then increased my nervousness. And then I got to meet the crew and my fellow actors and everybody was just passionate and excited about this project. And it was in that moment that I knew I could do it. And that I was ready to take on the challenge of learning something new of uh, how to act and interpret into music. And I uh, really, we came together and became a family. Uh, looking back, I can just remember being incredibly nervous and apprehensive. And uh, I, looking back, I regret nothing. It was such a great experience. Anyone else want to share their first experience? Yes, Sandra. So, for me, the day we first got there, my cat had passed and I was in a very difficult place. But coming into this family, everyone was so empathic. My friends that I was familiar with knew me and it just became a family very quickly. So my initial emotions changed from that day because I had lost my cat, but coming into this family and just chatting and having a conversation with everyone felt great from then on. We're gonna hold because Josh has come back to us right now. We're having some technical difficulties, so give us just a minute. Please accept my apologies. My computer crashed. I'm so sorry. No problems, we're glad to have you back. The important thing is that you're with us now. Yes, I was watching it on my phone and I was like, oh, but I'm here. I see you. I, I want to be a part of this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we want to make sure that uh, Elizabeth Green was mentioned. I just wanted to clarify that name. Elizabeth Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. What did I say? You said Linda, Linda Green. Okay, we are back up and running and we are live again.
Thank you all for your patience. And thank you, Josh, for joining us again. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry my computer crashed. I want to clarify, one of our ASL consultants was actually Elizabeth Green. I got the name wrong earlier. So the next question is for Alexandria. You were involved in Big River at Deaf West, which was one of the first large successful productions they did that toured. They had a very similar approach with a shadowing cast of mixed deaf and hearing artists. And the same director did Spring Awakening. So how was it being involved in Big River and what was different about Spring Awakening? That's a fantastic question. Uh, obviously they are two very different shows content wise. So they're kind of apples and oranges in that sense. Spring Awakening is more pop, more rock, whereas Big River production was not more flowy, but definitely a folk or folk style show. And for Deaf West, uh, part of their mission is specifically to try to combine both deaf and hearing cast members in these shows. So how that combination happens is going to depend obviously on the director. And with Michael Arden, we did the Broadway production of Big River and there were four lives in that one. There was the Broadway, there was the tour and two prior shows to that. And Michael worked on the Broadway production. We ended up kind of going off and living our lives and coming back together for the Spring Awakening project. And it is with great thanks to him and our time together in Big River. Pippin was another show uh, that we were working on and we wanted to focus on uh, me as a choreographer as an associate choreographer specifically. It was a completely different energy, a completely different feeling, a different group of artists. And when you were talking to them about their audition process, I didn't audition. In fact, I'm on the creative team, but I can remember my first time meeting most of the cast members. And when you see a younger generation of talent come in, it's really exciting and inspiring. The first day that we all came together, uh, I was a little bit behind in their rehearsal schedule, but it took me no time at all to feel the love from all of the other cast members and really get through those rehearsals. The vision was unique to each show. Both of them had something really special about them. I think each of them were their own gem in a way. Josh, you had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on what Alexandria said. I agree. I remember meeting her in the rehearsal room the first day and she was my ASL coach. <laughs> I was assigned to Alexandria. And she helped me throughout the filming process and rehearsals. She was I didn't realize that she was deaf and had worked with Meryl Streep, which just lit my life up. I didn't realize they had performed together. So that was an amazing experience meeting Alexandria. Yes, and Josh, you were one of the first persons to come up and help me feel welcome. So for the LA production, when everyone arrived and got there and you saw that half of the cast was deaf and half of the cast was hearing. And I say this with all due respect, but some of the deaf actors had very little experience. And some had no experience with musicals. You also had a hearing cast who were learning sign language throughout rehearsals and you were trying to mesh these two worlds together. 
how did that process coincide? How did it work for everyone? Trishelle? I think most importantly, all of us came to the table with an open mind and an open heart and an open spirit. Everyone was learning on their own as a part of their process. Some didn't come in with the skill already, but definitely had the drive to develop those skills. And there were lots of people who were willing to just engage and come in with that open heart. And we were in a safe space where the creative team and both our hearing and deaf cast members were all really in a place where they were willing to share their passion and come together to tell a story. And that's what we were all there for, was to tell a story. Josh, you had a comment. I remember when we first started this, Michael Arden's talked about being a painter and how he wanted to build this scene from the show. So when I came into the room and it was clear that both sides, deaf and hearing casts, were learning from each other. They had to learn sign language from us. We were learning the music from them. The show has so many canons, overlaps, and we were working on dealing with all of that. And so to start, I didn't feel comfortable necessarily with doing a musical. So during breaks, we would talk with each other, mixing casts. We would go to the hearing cast to talk to them about the lines and the canons and how they overlapped because it wasn't clear in the script. And so we were writing it in the script for ourselves. And so in the script where they were side by side, when there were canons and overlaps, we would literally handwrite them over each other so we knew where they came in as we were practicing translating and interpreting these songs. So we had to work together in rehearsal and outside of rehearsal. We had so many times that we would work with the hearing cast outside of rehearsal because we all knew that we had to make this work. So it motivated them to learn sign language. It motivated us to continue working on the script, which was just so inspiring to work with them. And we would hang out and play games and we really just became a family and that helped them learn sign language and helped us learn with the show. So it was a really great experience, I think. Yes, I think that those relationships really helped to develop the show. Uh, the casting and during rehearsals, learning lines, even coming out of rehearsals, we were still learning from one another and connecting with one another. Uh, it was a cast that, of hearing people that were very willing and motivated to learn sign. And as Joey mentioned, many of us came in without any music, musical theater experience from our side and coming together was such a growing experience. Miles. Yeah, we really had to work together on and off set. We had to get to know everyone, know their personalities. And to add to what Josh said, Michael Arden, our director, really painted the scene for us. And he definitely broke the ice from day one. We actually did icebreakers on a daily basis to help us get to know each other. And we became a family. There were no barriers, no boundaries between us. And we shared rooms together. We lived together and it just was a great experience. So I had no experience with dance or musical theater. And so I was thrilled and thank all of you for helping me be a part of this. I would not have been able to carry this myself without each and every one of your help. So I really appreciate it. Alexandria. Oh, how I miss you all. Uh, we forget that some of our hearing counterparts were also using musical instruments. So during those times that the hearing cast members had musical instruments, having to get used to those vibrations or how to choreograph that, and to see the outcome of all of the work that was put in prior to, just a lot of the little things that you had to learn on your own and then as a group, and people who are not 
dancers, working with choreographers and getting support from everyone in the room. And I'm running over to help the hearing cast members with their ASL. So I think that it all ended up coming together really nicely. I do think that one of the big advantages that we had was that Michael had already come into this with prior experience and understood what it was like to work with this type of dichotomy. There were two prior Deaf West, Deaf West productions that were uh, quite complex in nature. And that really helped kind of lay the groundwork for what we needed to do, the discussions that needed to take place, how we could be most creative and meld this into a cohesive show. Uh, I wish we had had some behind the scenes filming because uh, it's really hard to describe what that experience was in the room. It's really hard to understand and, and put that into language, what that feeling was. I remember when the LA production first started and I remember seeing advertisements on Facebook and Instagram from Michael Arden talking about raising money to green light the show for the production so that they could pay you as actors. I was floored with everyone who moved to LA and found their own places to live and found their own transportation on a dime, paying pennies and peanuts, making it work. So how did you manage doing that in LA for the first time? Yes, Sandra. Okay. So when so I moved, I... I lived with six people in like 700 square feet. I don't know. It was such a small place. I had my own room and the living room was divided up between other people and we just made do. But we made it work. There were six of us in this very small place. I was living paycheck to paycheck. All of us shared one bathroom. I know a lot of us had that experience, six of us sharing one bathroom. So it was really the passion that carried us through, just being a part of this project. It wasn't about fame. It wasn't about any of that. It was just believing that everything would work out the way it needed to. And it was a gamble. And I said, you know, I'm just going to do it. I rolled the dice and it worked for me because that's theater life, right? We just go for it. I think that Sandra could not have stated it any better. It was the passion that drove us. It didn't feel like work because we had so much fun in the creative process and working together as a team. Having a chance to show off our artistry was priceless. Alexandria, it was simple for me. All it took was trust. I wasn't earning anything in the beginning. <laughs> the money on Broadway was better, I won't lie. But just being a part of the creative team, we didn't earn anything in the planning stages. So it was just sticking with Michael Arden, taking it step by step, making it work. Because I, again, I knew Michael from before and I knew that he had a great passion, a good vision, and I just trusted in him. It wasn't knowledge, it wasn't logic, it was a gut feeling that this would work out. I remember, if y'all remember the rehearsal in the church basement before we made it to production, we were working in the valley with all of that in our luggage with ICA. And then with the snap of a finger, I think it was like summer <laughs> in 2014, I already knew we were gonna go to Broadway. It was just a feeling that I had. It was a smell in the air. It was an emotion. And I even said to Michael, I believe that we were gonna take this show to Broadway, even that early in the production. Thank you for that, Alexandria. It really ties into my next question. At what point during the show did everyone realize that this was going to be a hit? Josh. This was one of my favorite stories, in fact. Uh, when we were rehearsing for the first ICA, we got there the 4th of July and rehearsed until September. 
in a church hall. It was not a theater space. We didn't have any type of specialized lighting. We were having to move the set around that we had on wheels. And then we find we had to move the piano around and in and out of the building. And finally, we had Michael come and set up some light designing. And as soon as the lights were up, he was like, hey, get over here and start dancing. And so we played some music and had a great time. One of the drummers was creating some really fun beats that everyone could feel and dance to. Uh, during those rehearsal times for the show, we rehearsed for about three months. And I see everybody watching me and kind of giggling, but we were all put in boxes uh, to sit down and tell the story, what happens with no props, no prompt, nothing, just tell a story. And you just see people falling into their creative process. And I can vividly remember Trishel's song about being on the bed and the molestation where all the boys were grabbing at her on the bed and the bed is spinning and the girls are trying to climb on top and fight the boys. And I can just remember Daniel uh, being pretending to be shot in the head and then falling back and everybody immediately knowing to catch him. And there I was, I was crying. I felt like I was in the middle of a funeral for him. And then Sandra. Just to be clear, it was Daniel's character, not Daniel. <laughs> oh yes, 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 of course. Uh, and then Sandra was, or Vendela, excuse me, was speaking to another cast member and they were over by the tree. She was with Mort's. And one of the uh, directors came over and kind of pushed them together. And you could feel that kinetic moment of them coming together. And, and that's the moment that I knew, this is insane. This, you could tell me to perform this in the rain. You could tell me to perform this on the road. Wherever you needed me to do it, I would be there and I would perform it. Yeah, Josh explained that beautifully. I remember that moment. And I remember in rehearsal where people would just look at each other and like support each other, say we're doing a good job, rehearse our lines and everything together. And I didn't know if our show was going to be a success in the beginning because we're doing musicals with a deaf cast and a hearing cast. I wasn't sure how it was going to work. When we got to a theater finally and we're rehearsing on a stage and we saw standing ovations from our fellow cast members, I was floored. I mean, we all took a bow, <laughs> of course, but just seeing that standing ovation the first time it happened, I was floored with the audience's response. And it took a lot of work to get there, but that was a transformative moment for me, seeing how much people enjoyed our performance and our hard work was the moment I knew this was going to be a hit. We had worked very hard for months to try and show this story very clearly in two different languages at the same time. And to see our first opening show when the curtain closed, all of that applause, that standing ovation, is a moment that I will never forget. So I have a question for both Amelia and Daniel. You both had a very powerful song together. Both of you being profoundly deaf, was it feel? of the vibration? What were your frustrations in learning that song because it is so powerful and having to be on beat with the music? How did you feel? It's normal to have trepidation at the beginning. There's no confidence when you're trying something. There's the fear of failure and you know that it's completely on you and you don't wanna be the one that messes up the show. We had such a strong team and we had such a uh, robust set of visual cues that I knew I always had those supports in place should I find myself uh, offbeat or should I find myself not in the right place in the lyrics. And then of course it starts to become muscle memory the more that you practice it. And once we got to Broadway, uh, you wouldn't have any problems with maybe one person being a couple beats ahead or behind, uh, obviously not too far ahead or behind, but within a couple beats, we were able to get used to it and then 
uh, getting new songs was always was difficult. Uh, for two years, I got to sit back lightly and <laughs> sing, sing that powerful song with Daniel. I remember the first day we started that song. And of course I was nervous. I had read it from the script and I knew the words, but I didn't have a vision for what it was gonna look like or how I was going to sign it even. Again, I have no prior musical theater experience. And I was working with my ASL coach, Elizabeth Green. And I believe that she's a hearing interpreter with deaf parents. So I worked with her very hard on the rhythm and the beats of the music. And she worked very closely with me to help me stay on beat. And since I've been in theater, I've done three different cues with that cast. And so they would cue me to which line we were on at what point. And if I got ahead or behind, they would also cue me where we were. And so we worked very closely with the hearing cast to keep us on time. We also had lights that would cue us from the audience. When a light would go off, I knew that my song was starting and that was my cue. When the light would come on, I would know that the song was ending or those were also used for blocking where we were supposed to be on the stage, when we were supposed to kneel or stand up and all of that. So we had visual cues from the cast as well as technical cues. There were also specific blocking points that would cue me to when a song or lyric was starting. So we had to memorize all of that as well. So the choreography itself was cues for us to stay on beat. There was so much that went into this, but after rehearsing for months and doing the show for a long time in California than Broadway, we had it memorized. And these were things that the audience would have never noticed. It was just in the choreography. It was built into the show. Yes, Alexandria. Thank you so much to Amelia and Daniel for stating that. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that the audience wouldn't see. There were a lot of cues to prompt people as to when they came in and what those cues were had specific meaning. So you had to familiarize yourself with that. Uh, but we were really smart with this ensemble of artists. They were so passionate about their relationship, even with each other. Deaf to deaf, deaf to hearing, hearing to hearing. Really everyone connected in a, in a really strong way. And on stage, everybody had worked as a cohesive unit. And it was just such an inspiring thing to see, to see people commit to the work, as well as commit to one another. There were a lot of points where we were building tension throughout the show, or we had other cues built in and ways of communicating on stage if something happens, if you get too far behind in the music. There were built-in cues for those moments as well. And it was just such an amazing experience to see everyone come up and be really hardworking professionals and come together as an ensemble. It was an amazing thing to see. Amelia? Yeah, so there's one scene where we had the chair that I lifted over my head. And when that happened, I had to make sure that everyone was spread out and I had to count how long that was supposed to happen. I had to count in my head. It stressed me out every time to make sure that I had it right. I have a question for Miles. You mentioned before that you had no theatrical experience before this show. You had some film experience, but how was that for you? Your first role on stage in a live production? Did you feel like a fish out of water? Uh, it was a very dry environment for me, if you will, if I were the fish. Uh, I actually didn't have any film experience prior to being in the show. I had been on on the back end, I was a crew member, um, but hadn't really had a whole lot of experience with acting. Enough experience to be familiar with uh, productions and shows uh, through television. Uh, however, everybody practiced patience with me. Everyone was willing to help me. Alexandria was great. 
I think that it was a, a willingness that everyone came to the table with. Uh, I didn't come in with any type of preconceived ideas that this was something I would understand or be able to do. Uh, like was mentioned, I really came in with an open mind and an open heart and grew as a professional and gained an amazing experience and really felt like that was the moment that I came into myself as an actor. Growing up, I had always been interested in it, but really this was the first time I got to walk in those shoes, right? Uh, it wasn't long after it, after that, that I really knew once Spring Awakening closed that I wanted to be a professional actor. Now, you've got to do the work and it takes years of experience and hard work to make it in this field and familiarize yourself with theater and all that it takes to be in shows. So our next question is for Sandra, Trishel, and Daniel. In this show, we deal with a lot of heavy material. We talk about language deprivation, parental abuse, rape, teenage pregnancy, death, murder, all of these things. It's a lot to put into one show during the performance. Well, you don't have to put it like that. Jeez. <laughs> well, <laughs> but this performance, eight days a week, basically, because you had multiple shows on Wednesdays and Saturdays. How did you take care of yourselves mentally? Sandra? Well, with Spring Awakening, I familiarized myself with the script. I knew what it was going in, what it was going into it. So I really looked at myself to make sure I could handle it. I had to separate myself from my character. What were my needs for myself? What were Vendela's needs for her in the show? And I really had to recognize that it's their story, not mine, and that I could handle this. So what really helped me, honestly, is it was during the summer. <laughs> Had it not been, and I was winter and isolated and by myself, I probably wouldn't have made it through. But rehearsal during the summer and that time and that song about summer is what really carried me through it. And I know that the audience went through a lot of sad moments. And when Mortz had his uh, struggles, it was a lot. So bringing up summer, and I think seeing the audience's relief during some of those songs was relief to me as well. And then after that meeting with the audience, seeing how grateful they were, how they experienced the show was very helpful for me as well. Daniel? My character was Mortz and he's a very dark character. Uh, he ends up uh, killing himself at the end of the show and I knew going in that he would be a very dark character and that it had a component of suicide. Uh, looking into the role and really studying the character, I came to realize that Mortz, uh, during the Broadway production, you're absolutely right. We had uh, one day off a week, I think, uh, eight shows a week. Mondays, oh. yeah, we're dark day. Yep, Mondays. Oh, uh, Josh is saying Wednesdays. That's that's odd for theater. Mondays are usually dark days. For whatever reason, they ended up scheduling it. And that was the time where you could do interviews and media and that type of thing. Uh, but for the most, we didn't have any breaks throughout the day otherwise. Uh, but spending that much time with a character and really falling into that role, I had a kind of method acting approach and uh, I think that it affected who I am as a person today. And I'm, he is unfortunately depressed a lot and doesn't really socialize. He's a bit of a loner. And to break myself from those feelings, I would go back into the real world and do things like play video games and, and whatever else to really break myself from that character, do something out of personality for him. And being able to kind of break out of that, remember myself that I am Daniel, was a bit of a struggle for me, at least initially, but I'm very thankful 
that I really took an in-depth look at who that character was and uh, when he commits suicide, it is a very dark, ugly world and he feels helpless and he just feels stuck or trapped. Like he has nowhere else to go or no other option. And to have to go through that, I wanted to give that character the utmost respect. And I could really understand what it's like for that character to have to go through that type of feeling. And so I really, if there's anyone, people who I spoke with people who had had, who taught me a lot about depression and suicidal ideations, what people's thought processes are during that time. And so I'm very thankful for people opening up and offering me that. Trishelle, anything you'd like to add? Hmm, well, for my character, honestly, I understand. My character really hit at home because of the molestation from her father and what happened with her mom. So that character sort of, well, for me personally, reminded me a lot of what it means to be a fearless person. And so it took a lot internally that I've experienced as well to be able to tell her story. I think that character just has a lot of beauty. And I'm very thankful that I was in the dressing room with Amelia and Sandra because we were able to talk about a lot of things. I don't want to say we were always going with like Akuna Matata, but it just, being in the same room with them allowed me to release a lot and also to put myself out there with them, allowed me to be myself and realize that, you know, it's okay. We have these struggles through life, but it doesn't have to be a problem. Thank you for sharing. Alexandria. There's a lot of powerful themes that come up throughout this story. Uh, one of them that was mentioned was language deprivation. And uh, I want to highlight that that is not in the original script. It is in the adaptation that Deaf West took on because that was one of the ways that we had such an amazing cast of brilliant Deaf artists. We wanted to be able to tell this part of the Deaf story as well. Because during that time of Spring Awakening, this is set in the late 1800s. That aligns a lot with the deaf experience of oppression and the deprivation of language that deaf people were experiencing at that time, being separated from their families and having to go to residential schools. And the switch to oralism, I think that being able to weave that into the story of Spring Awakening with visual choreography and just like a perfect example is in the classroom, everyone looks at Mort's. It's a mixed classroom of both hearing students and deaf students on the stage. And there are people who have deaf students that have to practice their speech and that would have been appropriate for that period. Mortz misses something in that moment or is unsuccessful in producing that speech. And he's very young. And to experience that at such a young age is a really marked moment for many deaf people. And it's really dark. Uh, the coming of age and becoming a teenager, you're already trying to figure out where your boundaries are. And that's huge. Those moments are huge for deaf people. And we felt it was important in our adaptation to bring that theme forward. Yes, Sandra. Well, and to talk about language deprivation, the parents who already signed still struggle. My parents who signed, I still struggled to relate to them because I didn't know if or not I was pronouncing something right. It's just a culture and having access to all of that. And even still today, my parents, when they reach out to me and ask me, or hearing parents in general reach out to me and they learn sign language and that was important for me. Sign language is an important part of deaf community and I really appreciate my parents learning sign language. So I have a question for Josh. 
Can you see me? Okay. Yes, I can. Just wanted to make sure you weren't frozen. So Josh, when we talk about representation, you're an open gay actor and you played a character, Ernst, who is going through his own sexuality struggles. Did that have an impact on you? It's funny, I came out when I was very young. The first time I came out, I was eight years old. Uh, and then I came back out at 10 and again at 12. I, I went back in the closet and then back out uh, three times at eight, 10 and 12. And so being a part of Spring Awakening was a really interesting experience for me because uh, you know, you hear a lot of people saying it gets better, it gets better. And people keep saying that throughout the show, it gets better. And I didn't feel, I didn't always feel that. Andy, who plays my, who was my lover in the show. He was in the Smash TV show and I'm a huge fan of him. And I got to have the opportunity to meet other gay people. And it was a really validating moment for me because I came from a small town where it had been reinforced that being gay is wrong and that it's a sin and whatever else. And so meeting other people who were like me. And then we had the second run at Wallace. I can remember, and you have to get really close face to face, face and almost kiss in the show. And that was in the newspaper at Gallaudet saying that, oh, there's this openly gay character exploring his sexual idea, his sexuality in the show. And I hadn't imagined myself uh, having to talk about that as my own experience and liken it to my characters. But uh, people have come up specifically to meet me. Adam Lambert, who is a gay singer, openly gay singer, came and said hello to me. And I knew that I had to find the confidence in myself and I knew what those feelings were like. And so uh, people coming to me and deaf icons and Russell and Marley were such great team and castmate members. Uh, they validated my deaf identity above and beyond all and really made sure that I was good to go. I feel set. The whole experience was really validating for me. So it started in LA, and then when it was announced that it was gonna move to Broadway, what was your experience? I see Sandra's elated. Amelia, I was shocked. I <laughs> I had just cut my hair and I was like, oh my gosh, for this character, I couldn't have short hair. So we actually had to put in um, uh, wigs and extensions for my character. Miles is saying, when I got to Broadway, I thought I'd have some money and make it rain. When I told my family that I wanted to be an actor and that I was leaving Gallaudet, uh, it was after only a year <laughs> that I ended up leaving Gallaudet University. I was intending to take a leave of absence. And then DJ talked to me about maybe spring break and maybe going back to Gallaudet for a second semester was possible. I could do an online program. And I'm here to tell you, I am not an online program kind of person. Uh, then we had spring awakening at the Wallace and I just knew with the team that I had and the ensemble I was working with that it wasn't the right time to go back to Gallaudet. Uh, that I wanted to have this experience first. The show closed on June 30th. From there I was able to go home and then the first week of July my family said, hey, this isn't a joke anymore. You need to go to college. Uh, if Broadway works out, great. If it doesn't, Broadway will always be there. Uh, your degree is important. And I kind of believed the opposite sense, that Broadway is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and that I could go back to college at any time. Uh, and so I slept on it and woke up the next morning and realized we had gotten on Broadway and was like, hey, here it is. Look at it now. Yeah, it wasn't even a month. 
I was like, I had, I had a house, I had friends in LA and we were sort of on our own. We didn't have a lot of support in the beginning to be completely honest. So we did everything we could to make it through. We were, I was broke. I was living in a place with six people, like I said. And it was just, honestly, it was stressful. It wasn't fun in the beginning because of the stress. We didn't know how we were gonna make it. I didn't know how I was gonna pay for my flight out to LA. I had a cat at the time, so I didn't know what I was gonna do. And then when I heard we were on Broadway, I had to do it all over again. We had to find a new place. I had to figure out what to do with my cat. We had to get our own flight out there. But we made it. Alexandria. People often assume that Broadway is this glamorous lifestyle. And I'm here to uh, rectify that misconception. There is a lot that happens that is less than glamorous. Uh, at the Wallace Theater, the show opened and we were able to almost immediately, I went back home to New York, right? When we started, when we got the call to go to New York, they wanted us to start rehearsals in August. And so it was a bit of a shock how quick it happened. It was about six weeks from the Wallace Theater to get to New York and get the Broadway show up and running. Uh, we were able to take care of almost everyone pretty quickly. Uh, there were some additions and some changes that happened, but most characters stayed consistent. Uh, it was quite the experience, but we were able to pull it off. Well, and I think our show held its own going that quickly from LA to Broadway with a few cast changes happening with like a month or so. I think our show held its own and did very well. Mm -hmm. And that's not normal. We made it work. Josh. Sandra, Amelia, and myself lived together. And then Trishel and some of the other characters had their own spaces. Uh, I actually went $20,000 into debt just to get myself on Broadway. And I think that Miles ended up having to get a credit card and we're having to borrow money from one another. Um, but it was $20,000 just for us to get to move to New York City. So that gives you an idea of the cost and the commitment to the show. Uh, yes, we got Broadway and we were paid during our time on Broadway, but I used that money just to pay off what I spent to do the job. Outfits for red carpet events, I mean, it includes so many different components. Wow, Miles. Yeah, and just so you all know, I will finally be paying off my trip to New York next month. <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel you, Josh. I did the same thing. Oh, bless you. Wow, the sacrifices that you all made to make this happen. Thank I just you. love you so much. It was worth it. So we've talked about the show and Spring Awakening. It was not written with the intention of having deaf actors play these roles. And I know that we have faced issues with some of our deaf audience members that came to the show. Some of the hearing cast members sign and speak at the same time. And that was a critique of the show, which made it harder to follow for our deaf audience members. On top of that, when you're reading the script with the lyrics, Joshua mentioned how the canons are hard to follow. It's very vague. And some of it is very artistic and abstract. So it was difficult to translate some of this into choreography, into sign language. I remember reading an article with a deaf woman saying that she had a hard time following the show because of how it was translated and didn't feel like she had gotten the full experience, which I can understand. With all of those challenges that you faced, it, that you faced are there any things you wish you would have done differently or anything you would have changed to make the experience better for audience members? Uh, Daniel. As an actor, yes, uh, we go out, we meet 
our audience members after shows. And uh, that was a comment that came up often was that they didn't completely understand the hearing cast members signing. And honestly, being an ensemble member of the show, it was hard for me. I don't see it from the audience perspective. And I didn't necessarily get it until I went to Orson or Our Son, Our Town, Interpreter Correction, until I went to the Deaf West show, Our Town. And then I really got an understanding of what it was like to be a deaf audience member. I'm not sure in terms of how we could have improved that but there was access in both languages for both our deaf and hearing, hearing audience members. Uh, those hearing actors who were on stage were, could sign and uh, maybe there could have been some improvements to their language fluency, or we could have brought on actors who were already signers, who were already fluent in American Sign Language. So there's no clear answer to how you can do it better necessarily. I think my response is maybe having a dramaturge before the show come out and explain what the experience is going to be like for both audiences. So you have someone telling people what to expect. They can cover the themes that'll come up throughout the show, talk about how the abstract concepts that come up were made into concrete language choices so that the audience sort of has a perspective of what they're going to be seeing. Maybe that's an answer. Um, just so everyone has clear expectations that it is going to be a unique experience. Going to theaters with my hearing colleagues, they also say sometimes half the time really, they're missing what's being said on the stage, what's happening. So I think the entire experience doesn't necessarily have to depend on the words. I think it's more a lack of exposure or clear expectations about what the experience will be via the music or the play itself. I think that's a mutual experience between deaf and hearing audiences that they both miss some things that are happening. Our production was very assimilated between ASL and choreography, the imagery that we used, the trees were living human beings that moved. So I think that alone is a unique experience for either audience, deaf or hearing. It's never been done before. So there's a lot of information when you go to a show that's thrown at you and it's hard to decide what you're going to watch, what you're going to take from it. Yes, Josh. I think what Alexandria and uh, Amelia we're just talking about is this was a show that was written and intended to be for an entirely hearing cast. That style of theater Commedia and that, del Arte. that com is a Commedia del Arte. Uh, understanding the roles and styles, it's a very specific style of theater how the characters communicate their story throughout the show, sometimes is even without words. And that some are performing with masks and they only communicate through their body language. Uh, there are different types of acting theory. Michael Arden has a directing style. Uh, you can see three of his works, Spring Awakening, at the Lincoln Center Library. I went and watched that myself because I wanted to know what the show was about. And uh, I can see that more now. Uh, and then there was Once on this Island and The Hunchback. Watching those shows. I just want to make sure that you're talking about Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Michael Arden's style is a really in-your-face kind of style. Uh, we were looking at lack of communication, lack of connection, uh, moments that were hard to understand and moments that really pushed the audience. And that could be triggering for a deaf audience member because we experience that so often. We don't have to go to a theater to have to emote that emotion, right? We are deaf people existing in a hearing world. And looking 
a lot of people are looking at one another in the show. And that starts with a clear understanding. If you can understand Michael Arden's style, then you can really understand that maybe that's not the type of theater for you, or maybe uh, we haven't had access to all of the styles yet. Speaking specifically for myself, I can't speak for other cast members. Uh, it's not representative of my internal process, but that's something that the deaf community is learning. And I don't know that the AS So working at Wallace Theater with Amelia, she sort of dragged me into it. But I don't know if you remember, people did complain about the signing. And you can say that the ASL at Hunchback was an interpretive choice. I didn't like it. Amelia dragged me to the show. So it's just something that I wasn't able to grasp. I didn't like that show and that just wasn't the style for me. So I think I have my own character and I have my own reading of the lines and I offer what I think those lines mean it's my interpretation, but ultimately it's the director's decision and the choreographer's decision to tell their vision and their story through us. So not every style of theater is everyone's preference. I'm looking at the clock, we're almost out of time. When the show closed, I wanna wrap up with this. We still see a resonation from that. We see it resonating with the communities. So we are here five years later and we still see the impact of that show. Can you tell me how you see that if you do? I think I definitely still see an impact. You can see it on Instagram. People are still making art from our production and drawings. Uh, you see people taking the music from the show and singing it. I still think that there are impacts happening today, even five years later. Uh, I miss being a part of the show. And I know that all of our lives have changed since being in the show and being a part of such dark themes with rape and suicide. Uh, I see the show as helping us all grow and I have a connection to the audience through our performance. Uh, and I think that it's really stuck with people even today, even hearing individuals who can hear the music and maybe not understand the sign can still emote that, can still bring that forward. Being able to see it in sign language visually and hear it at the same time was really impactful for those individuals. Yes, Sandra. So just last spring, I was involved in a show, ZEP. Joey's Extraordinary Playlist. And the character that I had, I would not have been able to play without having my role as Vendela. I love Broadway, I love music, and that TV show is about a character that wants to be in Broadway, wants to be on stage in musicals, and so, I remember that feeling myself of wanting Spring Awakening to go to Broadway and wanting to be a part of it. And that really helped me develop my character and especially at bilingual, I, Josh? Everyone has frozen on my screen. Okay, so my character Abigail came from the character and my life of wanting to be on Broadway and Spring Awakening. And so that was Sandra wanting to be Vendela and that helped me be Abigail wanting to go to Broadway as well as my character in that show. I mean, I've been involved in many musicals afterwards and I always tell people, I always have people tell me that they loved me in Spring Awakening and that's always great to hear, but it's still a huge impact on my life having that experience. Yes, Hollywood and being in LA and being in movies, I think Switched at Birth and several other productions. 
people will often come and say, oh, I heard you were in the Spring Awakening show. Even in Hollywood, word has gotten back that we were all a part of this cast with Spring Awakening. And I think that it raised awareness as to what deaf cast members and actors and actresses could bring to the table. And uh, it was a bit of a surprising impact that it's lasted this long, but uh, we're very happy about it. Amelia. I think that that experience has also opened doors for other deaf performers. It was nice to have more opportunities because that show was so impactful on Broadway and it opened people's minds, I think a little bit to what our experience is. And I think there were deaf performers before that that thought they would never make it to Broadway, but then saw the show and realized that now these doors are open. And I think that that's been an amazing impact. We've had a few deaf touring productions and a few TV shows, but I think it'd be great for us to move into the film industry too. Every once in a while, I'll get an Instagram message or a Facebook message and say, oh, I saw you in Spring Awakening, even though it was five years ago. Uh, and these people will say, you know, it inspired me to want to learn ASL for my son or for another person that I know. And so just being able to bring awareness to American Sign Language, uh, parents with deaf children or deaf parents with hearing children, uh, it was a great experience to see that continue forward. What really, really gets to me the most is how people comment on the phenomenal job of the cast and the crew. I am venturing to say that we have saved a lot of people's lives with this production. I who struggled that. with suicidal thoughts and things like that that came to see us. And just the story of the show is very heart-wrenching, but also inspirational in terms of saving lives. And I'm really, really thankful to have been a part of this. So I want to thank the cast and everyone here and the crew. And I still, still hold this very dear to my heart. And I think that we're still saving lives today. Alexandria. It was so beautifully stated. I'm not sure uh, that we should end on anything else. Uh, I do want to say that uh, something that happened or came from the Broadway production of Spring Awakening, personally, as being a part of the creative team and being the associate choreographer, was that the ASL team really wanted to make sure that as the producer and choreographer, we also brought in a DASL, a DAZL, to consult for the American Sign Language. There is the executive choreographer. As we would come out, they would bring a piece of choreography and then the ASL team would bring it in and try to finesse it or try to talk through and provide feedback on what worked and what didn't. And so being able to bring the DASL, the Dazzle into the production was uh, protection for our intellectual property as the creative team and in the playbill, where are we putting those individuals, right? It's a weekly job. Do you get a percentage of the creative work? Do you get health and pension? There had been nothing prior to that. So personally, I realized that that was something that needed to change. There were many brilliant people out there who are committed to the art of language and being able to put that into a show and a theatrical production. And often those people are walking away with nothing but memories, no kind of monetary compensation. So I reached out to the EDC and educated them about that. And they were open to listening to the process of what a DASL did, a Director of American Sign Language, and I think that it really helped to protect those creative artists as well, because uh, this was a really defining moment when Spring, Spring Awakening came around. The amount of work and commitment that was put into it from these dazzles is not seen and they were not necessarily compensated other for that other than the experience. So that was one thing that I'd like to change. So our last question before we wrap up, at the end of the show, Purple Summer, 
is a song that wraps up the entire show. For this specific production, you see the back wall open up beautifully and the trees and then the cast exits through that door and it closes as the curtain drops. So it's up to a lot of people's interpretations what that means. How do these people's stories end? For you personally, what was your envisioning of your character's end in Purple Summer and in that environment? Miles. Well, it felt like Earth was this living hell of struggles and frustrations and that we were, some people viewed it as heaven. Some people just viewed it as, uh, for me, it was a release of pain. There's no more pain, no more suffering for my character. It's just light. Embracing the light and walking away from all of this hurt and pain and continuing life on. So that was kind of how I took it was a sense of letting go, uh, freedom of sorts, an ascension, if you will. Yeah, I feel very much like Miles does. Purple Summer is the end of a show where a lot has happened, a lot of turmoil. And it's just this sense of letting go. The darkness happens and whatever happens after that is what it is. For me, Purple Summer meant uh, we had all been fighting for ourselves. And we know who we are. Uh, every person has components of intersectionality. Every person is intersectional, right? We all have a multitude of identities and they intersect with one another. And anytime you feel those points of contention between identities with other individuals, I think Purple Summer represents that hope of investing all of the hard work into self-exploration and connecting with other individuals, having uncomfortable conversations and moving through that point in life and finding paradise, finding the release of pain. And I think that that song that closes out the show, is it's a pretty... It's a pretty dark show. And so this is kind of uh, the, the bow on the package, on the present, right? We're wrapping up the show and we want to resolve that dark sense of foreboding and represent this letting go of frustrations and experiences. We have a pop of color and flowers. You see the, the darkness coming up the sides of the show. And then there's this light and flower in the middle. Uh, and so leaving people with that sense of lightness and promise was what it represented for me. Okay, to wrap up our time for today's panel, I wanna say thank you to the cast of Spring Awakening for joining us today. It was an amazing performance, truly. When I watched the show, I felt proud to see my colleagues and my fellow deaf performers who went from, if I can say this, rags to riches, struggling together in Los Angeles, making ends meet, to your debut on Broadway, and still seeing today, five years later, the impact that Spring Awakening has had on deaf performers nationwide in the deaf community. I want to thank you all for that and for being the trailblazers that you were. Thank you all for joining us. Please join us again next week. We have a special guest. <laughs>